By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another Timmy's Top 10. In today's Top 10, we are going to look at the absolute worst cards in Magic the Gathering 93-94. So for this Top 10, we have looked exclusively at the uh, Alpha, Beta, Unlimited sets and of course the four expansions that is Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends and The Dark. So that's the card pool that we looked at. And when I'm talking about worst cards, I'm not talking about flavor. I'm not talking about art. I'm purely looking at functionality. What does the card do and how good or in this case useless is the card? And we are going to kick the list off with this bad boy, Casimir the Lone Wolf. Now, I love the art of this card, I love the flavor of this card, but I don't love what you get for 6 mana. This bad boy is 6 mana, 1 white, 1 blue and 4, and what do you get? A 5-3 creature, that's all, you know, I mean, 5-3, does that ring a bell? Juggernaut, it's only 4 mana, it can go in any deck, it's also 5-3. Oh yeah, 3 toughness, that reminds me of... Exactly, a bolt. You can bolt this dude. So you paid six mana. Your opponent taps one red at instant speed and it's gone. I mean, come on, at least make it a 5-5. Five five. Anyway, this is number 10. Let's continue with number 9. And at number 9, we find another creature. This is Mishra's War Machine. Seven mana for a 5-5 five five banner. And that's actually pretty okay-ish, in old school at least. But look at the rest of the card. Read the rest. During your upkeep, discard one card of your choice from your hand or Mishra's War Machine becomes tapped so you can't even attack with it. And on top of that, it also does three points of damage to you. So you get a bolt into the face and it taps itself if you cannot discard a card, right? I mean, this is just horrible. This is card disadvantage and the card's not even that good. Again, love the art. I love the fact that it's a big banding creature. It's one of the only creatures in old school with that ability and, and those stats. So that's great. But I mean, that upkeep cost. And actually, there are quite a lot of cards in old school magic creature cards that have a ridiculous upkeep cost. And guess what? We're going to see some more of those when we get further into the list. But for now, this one here is on number nine, Mishra's War Machine. Now let's continue with number eight. And on number eight, we are taking a trip to the farm. Here is Farmstat. Three white to cast. Exactly, I said it. Three white to cast for this enchant land. Guess what it does for three white? It reads target land's controller gains one life. Woohoo! Each upkeep if two white is spent. Target land still generates mana as usual. Well, boy, are you lucky. I mean, come on. Again, love the art. I actually also love the flavor. The idea that you're, you know, starting a farm on your land. I love that, but then when it taps, it should do more than just give you one life. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even give you one life because you've got to tap an extra planes to give you one life. So you got to invest two lands for one life. I mean, this card makes Fountain of Youth good, and that's quite an achievement. On number seven, we are finding our first cycle of cards, the Glyph Cycle. Yes, I've said it, the Glyph Cycle. And again, the Glyph Cycle, super cool flavor. I love it. I always love cycles in these old school sets. Of course, I have all these cards because I love it. I'm a Timmy, remember that. Um, but I'm sorry, man. They're just really, really bad, right? They're just bad. And I think the best, let me just start with the positive. There's one card in the Glyph Cycle that I think is kind of useful, and that is the Glyph of Destruction. It's one red, an instant. It reads, target wall you control gains plus 10 plus 0. When blocking, any damage dealt to target wall is reduced to zero, and target wall is destroyed at the end of turn. Now, unfortunately, it is destroyed at the end of turn. I think that's a bit, why add that? Just let the wall live. Let the poor wall live. But okay, what this does, it at least it kills a creature that is probably blocking with the plus 10, right? And you can combine this with Sword of the Ages. So Sword of the Ages is this card, um, you know, it's six to cast here. You can see it on the screen. You can tap it, sack a creature or multiple creatures, and it deals damage to any target equal to the power. So your wall now has 10 power. If it's a wall of fire or some other kind of pump wall, you can make it even bigger. And then you can deal like 10 points or 15 points of damage to the face of your opponent. Maybe even go for lethal. How cool would it be to win a game with a wall and a glyph of destruction? That would just be awesome. Anyway, but this is the best glyph, and that says a lot, right? The worst glyph, in my humble opinion, is the glyph of life. So it's one white and instant. Damage done to target wall by attacking creature, it, creatures is added to your life point total. So it doesn't even save the wall. The wall's still gonna die if 
you know, if it's an unfavorable block. So you're not going to save your wall with it. It could have said prevent all damage done to the wall. Instead, add it to your life total. No, 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 no. That would be too good, right? That would be, that would be way too good. Instead, it says the wall still takes the damage, but you can also add it to your life total. I mean, come on, guys. This was your way. This cycle of, of glyphs could have made walls playable in old school. I so want to redesign these because they're so cool. I love the art. I love the flavor. I love the fact that they come out of a D&D &D campaign by the creators of the set. I love all that stuff. But what they do is the thing I don't love. And it's pretty important in magic. Okay, let's continue to the next one because I'm getting emotional. And on number six, we find a religious card. Look at that beautiful art. Fasting. So what does fasting do? It's an enchantment from the dark. For one white, it read, reads, you may choose to skip your draw phase. Okay, okay. If you do so, you gain two life. Woohoo, another life gain card. After farm set, we get this. So you don't draw a card. What do you get in return? Two life. Maybe this could be useful, right? Maybe, maybe. Okay, let's read the rest of the card. If you draw a card for any reason, fasting is destroyed. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So it's not like you can skip your draw step and then, you know, draw an extra card with, for example, a jam day tome. No, you can't even do that. Anytime you would draw a card, you know, play Ancestral Recall, you're destroying this thing three times, right? But okay, so you cannot draw any cards. During your upkeep, put a hunger counter on fasting. When fasting has five hunger counters on it, it is destroyed. I mean, that is just... <sighs> what to do with this card? Again, love the flavor. You know, the monkey's fasting. It makes sense. But guys, you, you if you don't draw a card, you need some, you know, some better. That's a big sacrifice you're making. You need to give me something back to life just isn't good enough. It's so funny to see how in old school life gain was, was deemed to be so all powerful. Remember the boon cycle, you had healing soft and you had ancestral recall in the same cycle, right? That's just nuts. Anyway, um, I guess you could play this against an Underworld Dreams deck, but then still, you don't draw a card, you don't take damage, you gain two life, okay, woohoo! But, I mean, you don't draw cards, you don't get further into the game, there's no way to draw a card, if you draw a card, it's immediately destroyed, and again, you can only do this for, well, I guess five turns, which is quite a lot, but still, it's not indefinite, and, you know, your opponent can still force you to draw a card, you know? It, it's only about your draw step. So if your opponent plays a Wheel of Fortune, which is a card you often see in the Underworld Dreams decks, fasting is destroyed times seven. You know, I mean, insane. Let me know in the comments below if you find a place for fasting because I'm just, I'm fascinated by fasting right now. Wow, we are already halfway and at the halfway point, we find another cycle of cards. So all these cards are from Legends. They're all in Shamans and what they do, each color shuts down the land walk ability of their color. So you've got the Great Wall that reads creatures with planeswalk may be blocked as if they did not have this ability. And the blue one does it for island walk, the black one for swamp walk, the red one for mountain walk, and the green one, Deadfall, beautiful art, does it for forest walk. Again, love the cycle. And actually at the time when they got released, it wasn't that bad at all because there were a lot of land walk abilities. So why is it this high up on the list? Well, actually, there's one that's really high up on this list, and that is Great Wall, the card here in the center. The reason for that is, think about it, how many cards do you know of Planeswalk? How many? And I'm not talking like the Planeswalkers or whatever they're called in that modern shenanigans. I'm talking about old school magic, 1993, 1994. How many cards do you know that actually have Planeswalk? I'm going to let you think about this. Okay, I'm going to give you some hints. It's one card. It's also in Legends. It's very costly to cast, but I guess that's because it's got plain, it has Planeswalk. Woohoo! It's one white and four. It's a three one. It's got Planeswalk. It's called Righteous Avengers. So this one card in the set, Great Wall, only stops one creature, which is, I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? You've got this Great Wall, and all it does is it stops one creature. One creature that nobody plays. Come on, guys, make the card a little bit more playable, please. You know what's so special about this list? If you're here right now on number four, that means as a card, you're even worse than Great Wall. I mean, and that is an, accomplish an accomplishment here. So I'm just gonna clap for Cocoon. This is, this is something, again, 
I just want to say this. I know I've said it a few times. I'm not talking about art and flavor because I love the art and flavor of almost all of these cards. And I also love the flavor of Cocoon because your creature is going to go into a Cocoon and then it's going to, you know, evolve into something bigger and stronger. And actually what happens when the creature is out of the Cocoon, it gets a plus one, plus one counter and it gets flying. So that's not even that bad. The problem is the time you spend in the Cocoon is so long, you're probably dead you know, when the creature comes out, you're probably dead already, so it doesn't even matter. Let's read what it does, shall we? There's quite a lot of text on here. So, one green enchant creature from Legends. A lot of Legends cards in this list, by the way. Tap target creature you control and put three counters on it. Target creature does not untap as normal while it has one or more of these counters on it. Remove one counter during your upkeep. During the upkeep phase, after the one in which the last counter was removed, Cocoon is destroyed and target creature gains plus one, plus one, and flying. And it's a plus one, plus one counter. It can matter, of course, sometimes. But why is this card so bad? Well, in case, you know, you haven't noticed it while I was reading what it does, I'm just going to explain it here to you. So first of all, you can only cast it on your own creatures, which is annoying because it taps down a creature. So if you could cast it on any creature, at least you could just kind of use it as a green paralyze, I guess. But what this does, right, so you put it on your creature, your creature gets tapped. So that means that from that point forward, you can no longer use it, right? It's it's tapped. So there are three counters on there. You've got to wait until your next turn before the first counter goes off. So that's a second turn lost. In total, you're, you're going to need three upkeeps for all the counters to go out. So we're now four turns in because even when you take the last counter off, Cocoon doesn't go off the card. Let's read again that sentence, right? It reads here, during the upkeep phase, after the one in which the last counter was removed, Cocoon is destroyed. So it means you get three turns to take away the counter, one turn to put it on your creature, so we're four turns in, your creature is still tapped. You gotta wait till turn five, and then it untaps. Then it finally untaps. And what do you get back for all of that? Five turns, that's like an eternity in magic. Your creature has plus one, plus one, and flying, yo -ho! You know, this This is just bad. But I have to admit, there are a few ways around this. You could, for example, play with Jandor's Settleback to untap your creature. So then it doesn't really matter anymore that Cocoon taps it. But still, then you got to wait endless amounts of turn turns before you get plus one, plus one and flying. But okay, that's something. And I guess you could put this on an Enchantress. Maybe play it with Instal Energy, because then you can also untap it. So those are both enchantments. They can go in the same enchantment heavy deck. I guess. I mean, am I onto something? Am I making Cocoon playable? But then I thought, while I was thinking about all this, I thought, why not just play Web? Web is a lot. Web is like plus O plus two. It's one green. You can also play it in Enchantress. It protects your Enchantress from Bolt because with the plus one plus one, it's still boltable, right? With plus O plus two, it's it's an O four. So I'm like, no, this is just a this is a bad card. Not the worst card, maybe, but in my opinion, this is worse than Great Wall because you need to use one of your creatures and you basically take your creature out of combat, out of the equation for five turns, right? And that is, to me, what makes it so bad. But hey, man, feel free to disagree if you think Great Wall is worse than Cocoon. I think Cocoon is worse. Anyway, um, let's continue with the list, shall we? Wow, we have entered the top three and the first card on number three here is Recolite. So Recolite is six to cast for a Poli Artifact, meaning you can use it multiple times. Yeah, what does it do? Well, you pay two. So you just paid six mana. Please keep that in the back of your head while I read to you what this card does. You just paid six mana. You probably tapped out for this miracle of a magic card. And then what does it do? You pay two. You can do that multiple times, Poli Artifact, and it says prevent one damage to any target. Yeah! I mean, this card makes Amulet of Crook look good. And then you've got a serious problem as a card. Now, I'm not even done. It gets worse. Look at this. If Recolite is used, it returns to its owner's hand at the end of turn. All enchantments on Recolite are then discarded. So if you use it, it goes back to your hand. Maybe... I don't know, you're playing with Ivory Tower and you want this to be in your hand to gain some life, but this card is just really bad. If you invest eight mana, what do you get? You prevent one damage to any target and you got to put it back to your hand and you got to recast it again. In what universe is this card playable? In what universe? Please tell me. 
and on number two we find another cycle of cards and guess what it's from legends again i'm starting to see a pattern here i mean i love legends don't get me wrong again love the flavor love the art the art of these lands is amazing but we have to be honest to each other this these cards are just really bad maybe let's first just take a look at what they do so there's one for each color right that's important and what they do each color says all your mm -hmm, legends gain bands with other legends so if you've got the blue version it says your blue legends if you've got the black version here the unholy, unholy citadel it says your black legends gain bands right the problem here of course is is first of all how many legends are you going to play like legendary creatures how many legendary creatures do you have in the set in old school 93 94 i guess these lands are now probably a little bit better for the simple fact that you've got so many legendary creatures i mean i was looking at some video lately of the new cards every bleeping creature is almost legendary these days i mean legendary used to mean something right it was a cool lore character but now Every, you know, half-ass creature is legendary. But anyway, that's another discussion. Looking at these cards, judging them into 1993, 1994 card pool, because that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. I can hardly find any use for them. I think the biggest problem of these cards is that they don't tap for mana. I mean, remember, in old school, you also have ridiculously strong lands like Library of Alexandria, Mistress Factory. And what these cards have in common is, yes, they're ridiculously strong, but you can also tap them for mana. So you don't really miss a land drop. You can still keep your tempo game going, if you know what I mean. But these, you got to sacrifice a land drop to get these out. That means you want to get something in return. But with, the, with these cards... You get nothing in return. Where's my return? Maybe they could... You, there's a really easy way to make this a playable card. If it would just tap for the color that it also gives banding to, for example, this Unholy Citadel, if I could also tap it for a black mana, I could simply play the Citadel in my mono black deck with my swamps. Well, why would I play it in mono black? Because then I don't have any legendary creatures. Bad example, but you know what I mean. If I could at least just tap it, you know, for black mana it would be fine. Or at least, let's say, tap and sacrifice it for a black mana. Even then, it could somehow, in some kind of weird land tech situation, be usable. But you need to add something. That's my point. You cannot just say, it gives banding to only the black legends, and now it's good enough for your decks. No, it's not good enough for my decks. I mean, what are you thinking about? Ridiculous. Anyway, this is number two. We're not even at number one yet. This is number two. And before we jump into number uno, we are first going to look at a nice, sweet, honorable mention. Let's go to our honorable mention. And here we are at our honorable mention. And guess what? It's probably the card you expected to see on the number one spot. It is Soros Path, the poster boy for worst cards in old school magic. And I've actually put it here as an honorable mention. I'm like, I'm not going to make it number one because you expect this to be number one maybe it should be number one although i think my number one is also pretty bad but let me know in the comments if you think soros path should be on one or the number one that comes after anyway let's first focus on soros path this is a land from the dark in case you don't know what it does you can tap it and it reads exchange two of opponents blocking creatures this exchange may not cause an illegal block Soros Path does two damage to you and two damage to each creature you control whenever it is tapped. So it deals two damage to each creature you control. It, it doesn't say deals two damage to the attacking creatures where the block is being swapped. No, each creature. This is horrible. And also two damage to you. So this can be... Using this card is just really bad. And then I was thinking, why would you ever play with this card? And the only reason I could think of, but let me know if you, you found another reason, is because you want to give it away. And you can actually give lands away in old school magic. It hardly ever happens, but you can. You can swap lands, which is actually maybe something that players should do more often because there are so many good lands in old school. But uh, you can use a card like Gauntlets of Chaos to exchange ownership of land. So you can give your Soros Path to your opponent and then maybe, because I kept thinking about this, maybe then you can combine it with like twiddle effects, like with Icy Manipulator, and you can just keep tapping it down, you know, and untap it with a twiddle, then tap it again, and then you deal four damage to each creature of your opponent, and four damage, of course, to your opponent to the face as well. I mean, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of ridiculous, because you're going to play with, with a land that you want to give away, but I mean, in a sense... You can do that, and maybe with some kind of mirror universe where you want damage, you know, and then swap life totals. So there are a few 
weird ways of making Soros Path playable. And that's kind of why I felt like it shouldn't be number one, because in kind of weird scenarios, it could be an okay card. Well, still bad, but I mean, do you know what I mean? Am I making sense? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, let's go to number one. And here it is, the moment we've all been waiting for. Number one is... Wood Elemental! <laughs> How sweet is that? So Wood Elemental finding its way to the number one spot of worst cards in 9394. And I'm going to explain to you why I think it's the worst card. Maybe you think, ah, you know, it's a creature. What harm can it do? Well, it can wipe away your untapped lands. That's what it can do. It's one green and three for a creature with no power or toughness. Because you got to give it power and toughness. Let's read the card. Read the card explains the card. Asterisks in the lower right-hand corner are set to the number of untapped forests you sacrifice when Wood Elemental is brought into play. And yes, you heard that correctly. Untapped forests. So not even untapped lands. Or not even lands. No. Untapped forests. If at least this card would say sacrifice lands. Tapped or untapped, doesn't matter. And, you know, and that would add to the power and toughness of Wood Elemental. That would make it a lot better. You know, it would still be bad, but you could use it somehow with, I don't know, balance. Because you just sacked all your lands and you played a balance as some kind of Armageddon style card. I don't know. But the fact that you've got to pay four to cast it and the lands that you tap to cast a Wood Elemental cannot be used to sacrifice the Elemental. That makes it so bad. I think this card would have been really cool if they would, ma would made it one green and X. And an X would be the power and toughness. And all those lands that you then pump into the X would be sacrificed. Again, it would still be really bad. But you could do some fun stuff with it. And I actually have that a lot with these cards. I'm like, I love the art. I love the idea of making this huge wood elemental, right? Of, of using the power of all your forests combined to make this big natural elemental sprout up. And, you know, smash your enemy. I think that's fantastic. The problem is... They just make these cards unplayable. Why? Why untapped forests? Why? Just make it tapped forests. It's still bad. It's still not overpowered, but at least the Timmies in this world can play with it. I mean, I've got a wood elemental playmat. I want to play with wood elemental. I own one wood elemental, by the way. Funny story. I got that as a price at the Camel Trophy, an old school magic tournament, and I got it because I missed the most orb flips. I had an Argivian archaeologist Chaos Orb deck with me, and I missed like seven or eight flips. It was terrible. I would, it was horrible. Anyway, but I got the Wood Elemental as a price, and that made it all worth it because I love the art. I, I, I love, again, I love the flavor. I love the idea of sacking forests, you know, put that power together, that mana energy to create one big creature, but just... The fact that it's untapped forest, I can't. Anyway, this was my top 10 list of the worst cards in old school Magic 93, 94. I actually love all the cards in this list and I will probably play them as well. I've played a few in this list. I love them even though they're bad. Let me know in the comments below what do you think is the worst card of, in Magic or what card do you think should be added to this list and did you miss in this list? Because in the process of making this top 10, there were so many other bad cards that I could have put on here. And again, you know, it was a really tough choice. Remember, these cards, these lists are mega, mega, mega subjective. It's just one man's opinion. Feel free to disagree. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. If you think one of the cards that are not in here should be in that top 10, let me know. And before you go, please take a moment to like, comment, and share all these things are free and they really help the channel move forward and if you're not a subscriber yet please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell okay thank you very much for watching and now let's go to the end scroll
Ik het als fikker te somber gezien.